Revelation chapter number 6, and uh, there was just something that stuck out to me tonight, and I want to uh, uh, draw that out to you. Revelation chapter number 6 and verse number 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Let me read that again. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain because of the word of God and because of their testimony which they held. Aren't you thankful that uh, you're able to worship the Lord and uh, glean from God's Word right now in a country where we're not killed for it? Amen. Amen. There's a lot wrong with our country, but there is a lot right with it. Amen. Amen. We need to be grateful for the country that we live in. And uh, so I just want to, I want to draw a few things out. I want you to notice uh, we've used the word altar a lot lately, and we're used to hearing it in our everyday uh, church life, our vernacular. We use the word altar a lot, and uh, sometimes I think that we just don't fully understand as what the Holy Spirit wants to convey to us about the altar of God. So uh, I want to just draw to your attention tonight on the subject under the altar. That's what I want to kind of teach and preach on, so stay with me if you will. In Scripture, you'll find the word altar used 430 times, and of those 430 times, you'll find that 361 of those times are used in the Old Testament, which would tend to make us think that maybe the altar is not as significant as it was in the Old Testament because it's used lesser, the word altar is used lesser in the New Testament than it was. And, uh, but I want us to understand the, the, the less we use the altar, the Lord, I just believe this dropped in my spirit, the less that we use the altar, the less we become like Christ who was slain upon the ultimate altar, which is the cross. I'm afraid that a lot of people think the altar is old-fashioned. The altar is not old-fashioned. The altar is biblical in the Old Testament. The altar is biblical in the New Testament. And the altar has its purposes in the Old Testament. It's got its purposes in the New Testament. And I want to just say that again. The less we use the altar, the less we become like Christ, who was slain upon the ultimate altar, and that is the cross of Calvary. Thank God for an altar. Amen. Thank God for an altar for folks to pour their hearts out before the Lord. Now, what's interesting to find is in the Bible, the words on the altar, O-N, on the altar is used 16 times, and upon the altar, it's used 88 times. Now, these phrases, on the altar and upon the altar, are the exact same in the fact that it is an act of, of our will to place something or even in some cases someone on the altar. How many of you ever heard the phrase, you just need to put it on the altar, right? The Hebrew word, which is the Old Testament for the word altar, it means to slaughter. It's the word misbia. It means to slaughter, while the Greek word renders the meaning of a place of sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, they had to take their sacrifice to a place of slaughter where it could be killed. But to us in the New Testament, after Jesus came and died and rose again, and now we're living in the dispensation time called grace, we take ours to the place where the ultimate sacrifice took place, and that is at the feet of Jesus, the cross, and that is what the altar represents. When we come to the altar and we lay our life out before God, we are saying, Jesus, you are the ultimate sacrifice, and I am laying myself out on the altar at your feet. Everybody follow me tonight. I need not remind you that both places were a bloody place. An altar is not a pretty place. An altar is, was a place of horror. 
It was a place of pain. It was a place of hurt. And it was a place where the scene would become very gruesome. Can you imagine having to slaughter all of those animals for sacrifice, the blood, all of the stuff that had to be taken care of? It was gruesome. In fact, the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ, he was beat unrecognizable. Now let that sink in just a minute. He was beat so bad they could not even recognize him. Before he was ever placed on the cross, they beat him so bad, the scripture says, our ultimate sacrifice, he was beat so bad that you could not even tell who he was. Could it be that many now, when I'm talking about an altar, I'm not just talking about the public altar in church, I'm talking about a private altar as well. You need a private altar in your, in your life. You need a place where you can go in your house or if it's in the woods or wherever it may be down by the creek. You need a place where you can get along with God and pour yourself out before God. Amen? Let me give you a little bit of wisdom here. Not everybody needs to hear what you're pouring out at the altar. <laughs> right? Could it be that many do not believe in an altar service anymore is because it's a place of pain. It's a place of vulnerability. It's a place of sacrifice. It's a place where hurt is released. And yes, sometimes it's a place what looks like to even be a gruesome scene as people are emptying themselves out before the Lord, pouring their hearts out and lives out on the altar. We weep, we cry, we pour out everything in us. Sometimes tissue can't even clean it all up. But I came to just remind you tonight with a very simple thought to remind us of a place as a church as a people as individuals that love God with everything in us and that are in a life that we battle stuff and that we go through stuff that we must not neglect the altar even on this side of grace amen we need to allow people to throw themselves on the mercies of God we need to allow people a place, a time, a set-aside time for the altar of God so that not to sacrifice themselves as a sin offering. That was done by Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. But to cast our cares and our burdens upon the Lord who is our sacrifice. Let me show you something very powerful. Go with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 7. Brother Chris, I didn't give this to you, I'm sorry, but 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 7. I hear some pages of rustling. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. I'm thankful for my uh, Bible app on my phone. I can, I can actually hit play on it going down the road and I can listen to the Bible and I I use my Bible app on my on my phone all the time. It ain't nothing like holding the Word of God, is it? I love it. I just love it. I love to hear pages turning. First Peter chapter five, casting all your care upon Him because He cares for you. Now watch this. Peter admonishes us, and how many of you remember the message that I preached not too long ago with the cast net? You remember that? Thank God for the open throw. Amen. <laughs> Peter admonishes us to cast our cares upon the Lord, implying to us that this is a place that we do this at. Why? It's an everyday place that we cast our cares upon the Lord. Why? Because the next, Bible, the next verse tells us, he tells us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, that word sober means to be awake, to be, and be in your right mind, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roar lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Church, we have a real enemy. Amen? It's real. 
a real enemy that wants to destroy what God is doing in your life individually and wants to try to destroy what God is doing in his church. But how many of you know he cannot do that? Amen? Amen. That's why we have to continue to pour ourselves out before the Lord. We must keep a place of sacrifice open in our lives. Every single day, you need to take time. Even if you, you know you've got a busy day, anybody know what a busy day is? <laughs> Johnny Ray texted me at 545 this morning. <laughs> I hope he's listening. <laughs> because I don't think they're having church tonight. Now, I was awake. I was laying there awake, and I was just talking to myself and talking to God. Mostly, I was talking to God about myself, <laughs> right? And he texted me. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to text you that early. I said, no, it's all right. I'm, I'm up. But uh, how many of you know days can get really busy, and they can start really, really early? And what the enemy wants to do is to try to get you to neglect that time of daily sacrifice with God. Because he knows that if you continue to neglect that daily sacrificial time with God, he will be roaming around looking for a place seeking to whom he may devour. But if we'll keep ourselves on an altar of sacrifice, then he understands that we're going to take every single day and we're going to cast our cares upon the Lord. Guess what? He's going to go on down the road and he's going to find somebody else that ain't been with God. Amen? we got to keep a place of sacrifice open, an altar open so that we are humbled before God. The altar is a place of humbleness. It's a place of humility for the word of the Lord says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace to the humble. Friend, there's nothing more powerful than humbling yourselves before God. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you when? In due time. Notice what it doesn't say. <laughs> It doesn't say, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he exalts you in your time. <laughs> he says, so that he will exalt you in due time. God knows what time you need to be exalted in. Amen? He knows the exact time that he needs to exalt you to a place where you say, okay, I get it, God. I understand it. You just keep humbling yourself before the Lord. You keep sacrificing yourself before the Lord. And then in due time, God's going to come along. And it may be somebody that God sends along your way that you ain't talked to in 10, 15 years. And they say one or two words to you. And God speaks to your heart and says, there it is. Amen? Now, let me show you something. Look with me in verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Verse 10, but the God of a little grace, we have an all gracious God, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. Let's read that again. The God of all grace. Now, wait a minute, preacher. I don't understand that. If he's a God of all grace, why has he called me? And he's called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that. If he's a God of all grace, why does he let me suffer? Amen? After you have suffered a while... Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Why should Christians have to suffer? Because we live in a fallen world. Amen? But he says, I am the God of all grace 
who has called you unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, and he is acknowledging to his children, he is saying to his children, I understand you are going through some suffering times, but in that suffering time, I am going to make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. Glory to God. God sees you in your suffering. The words make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle are words of someone keeping you from being affected by something else. In other words, placing you in a place of protection whereby no matter what's going on, you're under the protection of ones whose power is able to help you in your time of need. That's what he's talking about. I will establish you. I will strengthen you. I will make you perfect. You will understand that even in your suffering, if you'll lay yourself out before me and sacrifice yourself to me every single day, here's my life, God. Whatever I'm going through, he will strengthen you. He will establish you, and he will will settle you. Somebody say amen. amen. No matter the attack, no matter the situation, the perplexity of the circumstances, we are placed as a child of God under a seal of protection. I think one of the greatest things that they ever came out with is when sealing food was the vacuum seal, right? It just lasts a lot longer. And I was thinking about that today as I was studying those words out. He seals us. And can you imagine he takes all of that junk, just takes it out of us and just seals us with his grace. I last a lot longer when I'm under his grace. Amen? A lot longer. Go with me to Psalms chapter number 46, if you will. Anybody getting anything out of this tonight? Amen. Psalms chapter 46. Don't you love the word? Ain't it good? Whew. So rich. Psalms chapter number 46. Remember now, we just walked you through what God's going to do. His grace that he has called us into his kingdom by Christ Jesus. He says, my child, I see you. You're in a time of suffering. After you've suffered a while, I'm going to do all these things for you, which, which brings to pass a place of protection. Psalms chapter 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake and the swelling thereof salah, pause, and think about what you just read. What the psalmist is telling us there, it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside, God is still going to protect me on the inside. Verse 4, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. I want to preach this so bad, but I can't yet. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That sounds like a God that keeps us protected. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse 8, come, behold the works of the Lord. Look and see what God is doing, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He's talking about the desolations where the enemy comes against. He makes wars to cease into the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in sunder. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. Glory to God. All of that that's going on, what are you doing? You're under his grace that he has brought you into by Christ Jesus. And now in all of the suffering that we're going through and the things that we're going through, he is establishing us, he is settling us, and he is strengthening us. And he says this, when you come and you sacrifice yourself before me at an altar, be still and know that I am God. Whew. He says, because I will be exalted among the heathen. All that mess that's going on out there, God's going to be exalted above it. Anybody notice lately we're in a mess? <laughs> he 
He says, I will be exalted in the earth. God will be exalted in this earth. God will be exalted. I don't know what's going to happen in this country, in the world, in other countries. I don't know. But I know what's going to happen to God's people. They're going to be strengthened and they're going to be protected. I do know that because his word says that. Amen? I'm almost done. Only one time in the Bible will you find the words that we started out with under the altar. Only one. And that's used for those tribulation saints who are crying out to God that have been protected from the wrath of God in the tribulation period. They have given their lives as a living sacrifice for the kingdom. After the church is raptured, but the same power of God that keeps us in the dispensation of grace in the time of grace is the same protecting power of God that will protect them even in the tribulation period, those who give their life for Jesus Christ. John said, I saw them under the altar, Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 says, John saw a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, nation, people, and language. And they had white robes on and holding palm branches in their hands. And John asked, he says, who are these? Who are these that are under the altar? Are, are, and those that have, they are those, the word comes back and says, they are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. I want to say something to us tonight. I thank God I'm in the dispensation of grace uh, and I don't have to lay my life physically down in the tribulation period. I can do it at an altar and say, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Give me strength. Give me mercy. And God will work this thing out all the way through my life. Amen. But God's grace and God's protection and God's power is so real that even in the tribulation period, there are going to be tribulation saints that hear the word of God. How are they going to do that, Brother Bill? Well, first of all, your Bible is going to be left right here on earth. Somebody's going to pick one of them up. <laughs> Amen? They're going to go, what in the world's going on? They're going to find your Bible. They're going to read about Jesus, possibly. They're going to hear about Jesus from the two witnesses that stand and preach the gospel for three and a half years. The gospel cannot be stopped. <laughs> when people lay themselves out on an altar, here on an altar in the time of dispensation of grace, friend, that's the time to do it is now, is laying ourselves out on the altar. It's time to do it now. Don't wait until the church is raptured out of here. You don't want to do that because then you'll be found under the altar if you give your life to Jesus. You want to be on an altar now. Amen? If you're here and you're not born again tonight, would you just please throw yourself on an altar of mercy and grace to God and give your life to Jesus? Maybe you're listening by live stream. You can give your life to the Lord right there. How many of you are going through some suffering tonight? Amen? I want you to do this with me. Donna, come, if you will, or Brother Chris. Y'all can, either one. She's coming. That'll be fine. Our altar services, they're for a reason. They're for people of like mind and like accord. Just lay ourselves out before God and say, God, here it is. If you don't have a place where you can go to and get before God on a daily basis, I implore you, I urge you, do that. It may not be but for five minutes, but you start getting in a routine of laying your life out before God. God, here I am. Get me out of the way. Let me be what you want me to be today. I sacrifice myself daily again for you today. I throw myself on an altar today. Use me and help me. Would you stand across the house of the Lord tonight? I'm going to open this altar and as many as will can come.
come around and pray and just maybe there's some needs on your heart you just need to pour out on the altar maybe lost loved ones maybe whatever it is you want to come this altar's open i want as many as will to come just spend a few minutes in time with god you can come right now come on lord we love you tonight we thank you so much Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed the sermon. We'd love to see you in person. We're at 2062 River Road in Sneeds, Florida, 32460. On Sundays, our Sunday school begins at 9 a.m., and our Sunday morning service begins at 10 a.m. Hope to see you soon.